This is my first friend divorce, so forgive me if I'm doing it wrong. It's probably, definitely, against the rules to text, but it's Monday the 30th of March, Ollie's 16th birthday. I can't ignore that. I won't. We met when the glue we used at school was edible. We have history. Sure, part of that history is him being very clear about not wanting to hang out anymore, but ignoring that little blemish. He thinks I'm boring. I only ever do what adults tell me to. He's wrong. I'm messaging him to meet me on the Founders Block rooftop in seven minutes. I'm not allowed to let anyone else up there. I'm breaking a school rule for him. That's not boring. He'll see that. I check the text once over for typos before sending it. I set down my phone and exhale. The cafeteria is buzzing. It always buzzes when pancakes are the breakfast special. I look to my plate, my overflowing plate. I told Lockie to meet me in seven minutes. I should have given myself more time. Whoops. I dart out of the cafeteria with a folded ricotta pancake hanging from my mouth. I spy Mr. Wilson under the jacaranda, chastising students who wear creative interpretations of our school uniform. He's a stickler for presentation, and I frankly don't have the time. I can avoid him by taking the back entrance into Founders Block, an offence punishable by stern lecture. I hesitate, remind myself I'm not boring, then sneak inside. The service corridors of Charlton Grammar are treated like poorly managed backstage areas, littered with props and forgotten artefacts of past productions. I run the gauntlet of rolled carpets, trophy cabinets and framed student artworks. At the end, a door. I pop it open a smidge, check the coast is clear and then leap out into the hallway. This is centre stage. Founders Block is the oldest building on campus, once the entirety of the school it is now the place where the important people have offices and host functions. The ceilings are high and framed by decorative cornices, and the floors are marble. Ms Rousey must recognise my frantic footsteps because she's waiting in her office with the keys held out. Nobody knows her exact role at school, but she has the temperament of someone perpetually interrupted. I greet her in pancake-lish, Regular English spoken through more pancake than any person should have in their mouth at any one time. She sighs. Chew, Connor, honestly. I grin at her and a piece of pancake falls to the floor. Ms Rousey arches one eyebrow severely. She doesn't need to say anything. I scoop up the food, drop it in the bin, and I'm out of her office before she thinks I'm up to anything. I scurry towards the disused stairwell. A teacher I don't recognise tells me to slow down. I do only until I pass him. When I get to the door, I fumble with the keys. They're long and heavy and stained by time, made for locks that should have changed by now. I separate the one with the more ornate head, twist it in the lock and push. The hinges creak. I slip inside and prop the door open with my shoe, ready for Ollie. There's no railing, so I hug the wall on my way up. After six flights, one wall comes to an end, the rooftop stretches the full length of the building. I ignore it and instead climb the cast iron spiral staircase in the corner. I keep my head ducked until the spiral stops. Students aren't allowed in the bell tower. It's expressly forbidden. Whatever, I'm in the bell tower. Sydney stretches out for miles, a patchwork quilt of roads and roofs disrupted by defiant bursts of green. The city marks the horizon, all spiked in silver. I watch the shells of skyscrapers and the cranes that fawn over them. I wonder what the view is like from there, if people in skyscrapers even look this way. The bell is twice the size of my chest. I reach in and feel around. I've taped a whole world of contraband to the inside. The bell hasn't rung since some bright spark proposed a less tiresome way to signal the end of class than sending some poor soul up a mountain to bash a bent piece of metal. Come to think of it, the poor soul was probably the bright spark. Last week, while brainstorming ways to demonstrate to Ollie how not boring I can be, I realised the bell was perfect for hiding snacks. Charlton Grammar has waged a war on taste, and certain foods can't be consumed on campus without prompting several petitions from the Militant Parents and Friends Association and a passive-aggressive mention in their newsletter. They want us to live fuller, healthier lives. And I get that, but counterpoint... Junk food is incredible. I pocket the peanut brittle for myself and a packet of chocolate-coated almonds for Ollie. I pull back and soak in the view again. 
roads, roofs, green, silver, got it. And descend the spiral staircase. I forget to duck and whack my head. My skull throbs. Nice one, I mutter. At the foot of the staircase, a garbage bag is tucked under a brick. I leave the brick and drag the bag out onto the rooftop. It whips violently in the wind. I stop at the first pole and fish out the correct flag. It's the school's emblem, a black wyvern with a forked tongue poking out, stitched on white polyester. When students are old enough, the teachers assign us chores so we can share in the thrills of maintaining a centuries-old building. I got off lightly with flag duty. All I have to do is raise the flags of a morning and lower them in the afternoon. Some kids have to mop. And this, at least, has its perks. Two flags raised in the correct order. It's a 10 minute job I can stretch to 20 and miss the beginning of my first class. That's not to say I've ever missed the beginning of my first class. I haven't, but the potential's there. I rest the brick on the empty bag and return to the rooftop. I lean against the barrier and empty my pockets. I watch my phone. I swipe one finger across its screen. There are no new notifications. Ollie's late. Okay, maybe that's unfair. I didn't give him much notice. He has until the bell. That's plenty of time. He's had three weeks to come to terms with the fact that life without me isn't too crash hot. He'll want to repair things and the door's open. Literally, I've propped it open with my shoe. My phone vibrates. My heart punches my chest. I assume it's him, but it's mum. I exhale and answer the call on speaker. Yo. You didn't call this morning. I wince. It slipped my mind. We were running late. Well, run later and call me. She isn't mad, but she's dangling the fact she should be. How are you, darling? I'm well, thanks, darling. A pause. It's weird when you say it. That's why I say it. Did your father feed you? He gave me money. That's not the same, she says. Did he wash your clothes or did he accidentally throw them in the bin again? Mum's bids to win best parent are never subtle. He washed them. Not as well as me. She clicks her tongue against her teeth. Am I on speaker? I stare at the phone that is definitely on speaker. No, it sounds like I'm on speaker. You're not. She drops it. How was your weekend? As far as weekends at Dad's go, it was pretty standard. There was a lot of lounging on the couch, unless Dad wanted to watch sport, then there was a lot of me vacating the couch. I tell Mum the weekend was fine. Yours? It was... I visited your grandfather. I imagine Papu, his receding grey hair slicked back. He sits upright on a stool in the sprawling backyard of his place in Carlingford. He has an apple in one hand and guides a knife through it with the other. He motions me closer with a tilt of his head. He holds out the slice between his thumb and the blade. How is he? I ask. She's silent. It's a silence that says too much. I think you should see him, Con, she urges eventually. That's worse than the silence. I know what she's hinting at. I sink deeper into the barrier. The patchwork quilt of roads and roofs stretches over the hills to the north. The nursing home is out that way. He moved in after we sold the place in Carlingford. When I last saw him, Babu was a frail man under wisps of white hair, hunched over on a plastic-covered couch. That was a while ago. Almost a year. It's Ollie's birthday, isn't it? It's her attempt to pivot the conversation away from her father to safer territory. She doesn't know about the friend divorce. It is, yeah. Knew it. Mum's a freak with dates. She can't remember the names of streets or movies, but tell her somebody's birthday and she'll never forget it. It's usually helpful but not today. Are you all going out tonight? Seeing the biggest, loudest action movie on Ollie's birthday has become our annual tradition. He brings his friends, his twin brother brings his, and we almost take up an entire row. It's epic. This is the first time I haven't been invited. Yep, I regret it as soon as I've said it. Were you going to tell me or were you going to keep me up till midnight worrying? I was going to keep you up till midnight worrying. She stifles a laugh. Tell me you bought him something nice. I look at the packet by the phone. Chocolate coated almonds. Con. They have special meaning. They mean you bought them on special when you should have spent more than five dollars on your best friend, she says. You can pay me an allowance. You can pay your own school fees. I'm gonna hang up now. Thought so. Don't be later than twelve. I won't. 
Be good. Always am. The call ends and I breathe it out. I've just committed myself to being out until midnight and I have nowhere to be. The door might be open, but Ollie isn't walking through it. He'll be here, I tell myself, unwrapping the peanut brittle. It's his birthday. He'll invite me to the movies. It'll be like these three weeks never happened. I finish the peanut brittle and the digital bell rings. The students in the courtyard below begin their slow dawdle to class. Ollie isn't coming. I'm tempted to take a photo of the almonds and send it to him. One final, I smuggled these in last week to prove I'm not boring, before I accept that sending a photo of chocolate-coated almonds is possibly the most boring way to prove you're not boring. I tape the packet of almonds back inside the bell. While I'm up here, I look over to the city again. And however many years, when I'm in one of those skyscrapers, Charlton Grammar will be a speck in the distance. I wonder if... I'll even remember the taste of the glue we used in kindergarten. Probably. I descend the disused stairwell. I slide my foot into my shoe, shut the door and linger. In a corner first, I don't want to go to class on time. I don't want to see Ollie. I don't want to walk past the books he's stacked on my old seat so I can't sit there. I don't want to be reminded that my oldest friend doesn't want anything to do with me. I separate the ornate key from the others unlock the door, kick off the shoe, and wedge it between the door and the frame. I return the keys to Miss Rousey. She scowls like I've just interrupted her. You've lost a shoe. I step over it when I return to the disused stairwell. I fetch the chocolate-coated almonds I was saving for Ollie and head back down the stairs alone. So that's the first chapter of Monuments. It's available now from bookstores and libraries. Its sequel, Rebel Gods, releases in September. I hope you enjoy.